this introducing the original blood clad podcast not PS. Sword in semantic. Special dedication all the way from New York. Boom! Yeah man, SWT semantic. Yeah man. Boom! Sword in semantic. Yeah man. Big ups to the man. Sword in semantic. It is time, ladies and gentlemen. Have you guys, have you been looking for luxury watches for quite some time or have contemplated doing so, but you don't really know who you can trust and where the best prices are? Look no further. Time for Luxury has got your back. Make sure to check out the site. Some of the watches they sell include Patek Philippe, Rolex, AP, Cartier, Hublot, Richard Mill, and many others as well. Make sure to check them out. You will be very, very glad you did. On another episode of Soothing Semantics, I'm your host, Rafa Pinsky. Make sure to subscribe, like, share, leave your comments. Make sure to check out Kobe Karp's Instagram. I'm going to drop all the social media links. Check out Rafi the Realtor as well. Today, we have a guest who I've been uh, chasing down for a little bit of time. We were going to do a, uh, a virtual meeting. And uh, right when I started the meeting, I, I said, hey, man, why don't we do it in person? He said, oh, okay, we can do it in person. And uh, here we are. So, Kobe, thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So, for all of you who don't know, I'm sure many of you watching this already do know Kobe very well. Whoever does not, he is an architect who has basically designed Miami, more or less. He's done work in Dubai. You've done work in Russia. Uh, We'll go into other places you've done work. Um, There's so many projects you've worked on, residential, commercial. You've done work in Whitwood. I mean, the list goes on. So go into a bit of the backstory and where you grew up, what brought you to Miami, um, and how you got into architecture to begin with. We'll go a little, a little further back. So I've been in Miami since 1988, which is uh, the Miami Vice and Scarface days. A little bit different than it is today. Um, and I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's where I went to um, sixth grade, junior high, high school, university. And my first degree was uh, environmental design, which became more of an important degree now in sustainability and resiliency in the world. And I was born in Israel in 1962. So at the age of 11, I moved to Minneapolis. I grew up in Minneapolis. I went to school and became a licensed and registered architect in Minneapolis, in Minnesota. And I moved to Miami in 1988. Um, And we basically started to build a lot of Hotels and resorts in the Caribbean. So that's where you started. That's how I started, and I became a registered architect at the age of 24, mm-hmm. um, which is quite young. And since then, I've been living here in Miami through the growth and the historic preservation and um, the development of uh, Florida. So I've been in Miami since 1988. And most of the projects that we do here are lifestyle uh, developments mm-hmm. from the ground up, whether they are uh, luxury or mixed use, uh, that's what we specialize in doing. Okay. I mean, what are some of the big projects you've done in Miami? Recently, right now, we're finishing off the uh, Four Seasons in Fort Lauderdale. We have a mixed use under construction in Coconut Grove. Um, it's a residential with a commercial. Um, it's on Grand and uh, 37 Avenue and uh, US 1 there. It's quite a nice corner. It's called Platform. Um, we have a couple of projects, multifamily residential, that we're doing in uh, Dania Point and Dania Beach. We have uh, luxury condominiums under construction in Tampa in the uh, Bushel Marine District. We have a number of projects currently. Um, coming out of the ground now in Miami, in uh, Miami on the river, um, and a number of uh, other locations like that, which are very special and unique because 
the opportunity is really to create districts and neighborhoods in areas that have kind of been run down and derelict over the years. Um, we recently finished a Moxie Hotel in Miami Beach. We did a Moxie Hotel in Wynwood. We finished a Wynwood 25, a uh, mixed use uh, multifamily residential next door. Um, so there's always a variety of projects that we are involved with. That's phenomenal. I, I, I see a lot of, I mean, I check, I follow your Instagram, so I see a lot of what you're posting. I like what you did with your office in Wynwood. It has that Miami, that pink Miami vice. Mm -hmm. Kind of look to it. Yeah. Yeah, people like that kind of uh, location. It's uh, cool and hip, and what we did is we lit it up so at night everybody can enjoy and see the murals as they drive by. And uh, it's a beautiful uh, campus to be located at on uh, 6th Avenue and 29th Street. It's an interesting neighborhood that's um, being developed right now and coming along to its own. So it's an exciting time to be there. Um, I love Wynwood. I love that location. Um, it's very accessible, so we're happy to. Wynwood used to be very crime driven, right? Because I, again, I'm, I'm fairly newer to Florida. Uh, look, I think that crime is relative. I think that there's um, now that we have been living through COVID. Um, when I came here to Miami in 1988, it was Miami Vice and Scarfaces. So mm -hmm. it, you're, not, you're not a cop, right? Huh? You're not a cop, are you? I'm not a police officer, no. <laughs> you're a cop. What? You're ignoring us, you're a cop. <laughs> We're guessing who cops are. You know most good looking women are cops? <laughs> well, I'm going home, all right? He's playing with his new guys. And, and what I do basically is I find ways to create designs, uh, local, domestic, international, that the community and the people would get a benefit from. Um, creating that kind of a design creates an ambiance and a value um, that is ongoing. We do that in historic structures, um, like the Cadillac Hotel. Um, we bring the people in, we restore it. Next door, we did the Caribbean condominium. The lobby, the, in essence, is in the historic building. So we bring you into the hole and tell you the story. We walk through this beautiful terrazzo streamlined lobby. Um, and you go, wow, this is interesting. And then we bring you into the construction. Um, it's something that uh, we've been doing for quite a while. Palazzo in, in Fisher Island, that was that already constructed and you kind of brought it back to life? Or did you? No, that's from the ground. Up. Palazzo del Sol and Palazzo de la Luna. Um, our new construction. And they take inspiration, again, from the historic structure that has been there since the late 20s by the name of the Vanderbilt Mansion. Mm -hmm. So we took that kind of DNA and used it for our luxury prototype that we're doing in um, Fisher Island. Um, we, I'll give you another example. We did the design back in 2012 for the surf club. And the surf club was a private club, but by opening it up, putting condominiums there, and introducing the hotel, yeah, it became the historic building that was built during Prohibition in 1929, it really became a destination where people could go, walk in, appreciate the historic design and the quality, and then walk into the buildings. It gives it a certain essence. It's, it's like people. So when you meet people and you find out where they came from, if you ask them the first question, where would you come from? And you get to know people where they came from and what DNA and what their past is and who are their um, forefathers and foremothers, it makes it an interesting story because what you have is um, understanding the history. It helps you understand your future and envision your future better. And that is the kind of a storytelling that we like to do. Whether we do it at the surf club, or we do it at uh, the Caribbean condominium, or we take inspiration from the Vanderbilt Mansion for Palazzo de la Sol and Palazzo de la Luna in um, Fish Island, that is what we do on an ongoing basis. That is something that is, I think, unique in 
telling the theater and the story of where people came from. And people like that more. They relate to the designer, to the architecture. You have to get a little bit of a feeling um, about the history and where it came from. So getting to know somebody, knowing their family, you become more, um, you become more exact, for sure. Yeah, that, that's why these, um, these colonial buildings, you, you don't see as many in South Florida. South Florida is a newer city in say New York where I grew up. But these, these massive colonial buildings in DC, in New York, they're mesmerizing. And I, I, that's, you're a great person to ask. When you see buildings like that, how do they come up with their designs? They're so majestic. They have the, the pillars and all these other, do, you, do any of your projects I mean, I've seen a lot of your stuff, I've seen a lot of your projects, but do some of them have that, that colonial, uh, I guess you can say, edge to them? I think that what, you, what I try to do is I try to make statements, architectural statements. I believe that good design is inherent, it's a given, it has to be a great design. Um, whether it is a luxury or affordable housing, if you've been to overtime, um, and you go to the Red Rooster restaurant. And I've heard of it. I mean, you that. come out of the Red Rooster out of the front door and you look across the street, there's a beautiful building there, um, which we did in a more traditional um, a Caribbean flavor. And what happens is that it relates to the community in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It sits on a beautiful linear park next to it. Um, and But that's affordable housing. But people walk by and they look at it and go, wow, it's beautiful. They don't know if it's market rate, they don't know if it's condos. So architecture and design inherently has to be good. It, great design is, is not dictated by cost. Great design is dictated by coming up with ideas and suggestions and uh, feelings. And that's what I try to appeal to. I try to appeal to the sentiment, to the psychology, to, to the emotional feeling. Um, that's what I design for. So people who come into the buildings, they don't necessarily understand why, but they feel uh, the warm and fuzzy and comfort of the design. And that's important to, to provide because people automatically get drawn to it and people automatically want to buy there. And they don't really understand why. Um, but most of today, after COVID, after pandemic, the indoor, outdoor living. How does the light come into the space? What is the feeling? What is the sentimental, emotional, psychological um, sort of a destination I can create with space? Is what carves out and creates the value that many, many people ultimately feel like paying top dollar for um, and create a value. And that's what we have been successful in doing. Um, we strive to do it, we try to do it, and generally speaking, most times we are very, very successful. And the projects that we design, um, you know, nothing gives you a greater pleasure than sitting in a restaurant or on the beach or in a line, and somebody says, oh, I live at the Grand Venetian. I live at the Capri. I live at a building that we designed. So I really like it. You know, I like and they describe certain spaces, whether it's the lobby or the amenity area or the light that comes into their apartment. People uh, get drawn to that. And we do that also in houses. We do homes in Miami Beach and people ask me, Kobe, why is it that yeah, we just finished a house and it's not necessarily the biggest house, but it's so for four thousand dollars a foot in Miami Beach. Mm -hmm. Um, and people, you know, when you ask the owner, why, why did you choose this house and why did you, they say, yeah, the finishes are beautiful, the house is gorgeous, but there's something about it that just makes it feel good about life, but it's a clothing that fits well, right? Absolutely. You can't really describe it, but it fits well, and you say, that's what I want to wear. And it's, it's people, in, when they come into a home, into a house, into a structure into an office. It's like you're talking about my office. My office, we converted it to that space. It had, we recycled the building. But by recycling it, 
and creating the path and circulation in a way that makes sense, it starts to work very well. Because designs and buildings are like you and me and everybody else who's watching and listening to this. Generally speaking, hopefully we're healthy enough, we have one heart, a couple of lungs, you know, the spine, ribs, we're basically built all the same way, the components are all the same. But we are substantially different when it comes down to it. whether you have a brother or a sister, um, you are, you know, you came from the same mother, the same father, you are different. Even twins, even identical twins are different. Yes. Absolutely. And that's what makes it exciting as an architect, you know, because we design the buildings, but they're different from location to location. And that's what gives me the inspiration to wake up in the morning and desire to do it. Um, yes, it's a, it's now that I'm older and I'm almost 60. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, say 35 is that old, brother. Yeah. I've been doing it for about 35 years. It's longer than I've been alive. It's, uh, it's yeah. It's amazing, but you can start to see how these things come together. And I've had great pleasure of working with great people um, around the world. And um, it, it gives you a certain amount of pleasure to see people who are happy. I have a question for you. Do you see yourself as the kind of the line of work you do? Do you see yourself as a perfectionist? I mean, don't you kind of have to be? I think the perfection uh, does not exist. Perfection does not exist in, in you, me, in the way we were made, the way we think, the way we were created. Um, perfection is not the reality of life. Um, I think that progress and evolution and dynamic thought process is maybe not static, is important for constant progression. I think that looking at architecture, where it's the Acropolis or the Pyramids, or the Sistine Chapel, um, it gives, or, or the White House, right, or you can look at any kind of building, that you can take inspiration from. But ultimately, it's structures that have interior space, not door space. Uh, I'll give you examples of outdoor spaces that are very unique and special. Here in the United States, the Statue of Liberty, the ability to see the statue, come to it, walk around it, what do you feel like around it, but then you can walk into it. And you're into it, then you're walking through it, and you're at the top. That kind of an experience is not is not so much different than walking into a historic church and walking through it and into it and walking up to the steeple with it. Um, you know, that, those are the kind of things I think that are important to capture people's emotions and, and psychology. That's what people remember. That's what people remember when they grew up when they were young, and they remember where their home was and how they were raised. I try to get into that psychological, sociological, historic preservation, environmental sustainability that then can create a space within your number that is special and unique, and that's what creates the value. And that is what I have been lucky enough to see and perceive and understand and provide it to other people. Um, because at the end of the day, we're in the service industry. Uh, there's a million and one architects around the world. Um, anyway, you're not the only one? Uh, no. And, I, and <laughs> I'm not the first and I won't be the last. But it's while you are doing it, how you can provide a stage set, a story, a movie, um, that makes it interesting for people to participate within and cherish it and, and personalize it for themselves on an ongoing basis. For sure. Uh, I wasn't sure. Okay, so I definitely want to ask you about Surfside. I've seen, I've definitely done my research and I saw you did a video on Surfside. It's totally, well, it's, it's definitely related. What do you feel it may do other than uh, stricter regulations <clears throat> going forward for condos. Do you think it's going to limit any sort of growth? I mean, they've already demolished every. Well, you know, they took they cleaned everything up and they're already starting to to plan for rebuild for rebuilding. You know, what do you kind of think will be as far as South Florida and these regulations? Look, I'm an optimist. Um, a comp to it would have been we had Hurricane Andrew in '92. 
And after Hurricane Andrew, it gave us an opportunity as a, as a community, as professionals, to revamp our Florida building code. And our Florida building code now is more progressive and more advanced than many, many, many other codes throughout the United States of America. We just had tornadoes that went through the Midwest, the upper Midwest. Crazy. Wow. And they killed people, and um, buildings were just blown away. Thank goodness, since 1992, um, we have had an opportunity to revamp our buildings. We're going to make a glass of the structure. So I think that the means and method that we designed for today is completely radically different. Well, real quick to, to interject, tornadoes versus hurricanes. We're talking a strong tornado. Now, tornadoes, as far as I know, don't hit Florida too often, maybe up north. But generally, we have more populated areas and less space. Tornadoes don't have as much room to, to occur and, and stick around. So how do, how do you make a building tornado-proof? I mean, is it... You design it for the buildings we design today are hurricane uh, impact design. So that if a hurricane, if it takes a direct hit by a hurricane, the glass is designed to sustain um, a category five. The glass, the concrete, the steel, the roof, all of that. And I'll give you another example. You know, before it was used, and you said you saw me on that. The reason is a few years ago there was a horrendous fire. At the Church of Notre Dame, right, right. And, and they called me up and said, "Oh, we want to talk to you about it." And what happened there is that again, the wood was dry in the structure. The roof was a lead roof, mm -hmm. and people were fixing it with hot torches, which sparked the fire. Or a cigarette was thrown, sparked the fire. Like what happens in California, because there's so many the droughts, so yes. a lot of the, you know, the, the wildlife and the plants are, exactly. are dry. Exactly. And so it created an opportunity for that whole roof to just poof, get chopped out. And the velocity and the speed that it took was pretty immense. So people asked me, oh, what do you think we should do? And you know, different architects came up with different ideas how to build glass roofs and make changes to the original design. Well, I said was, you know, it, it would be better to restore that church, to restore the roof and bring it back the original design as much as possible. And obviously now with sprinkler systems, and we have the technology, we have the ability to preserve these structures. And I think what people have seen since then is there's great old churches that a lot of people visit, and we need to spend the money and the time to put a system in there, whether it's wet sprinkler or it's dry sprinkler, or whether it is a fire separation or fire alarm system. So people know right away what's going on. Um, in that case, there was no fire alarm system. And it just burnt away. And hopefully, it will be restored. And they asked me, you know, how long do I think it's going to take? And you know, people said, well, in a year or two, people are going to throw a lot of money in there. No, it doesn't happen that way. It takes years and decades to put these things back together. From 92 until we had the new code, and really implemented it, it was like 10 years. It was only 2000. And Two, 2003, four, five, and that, that's the boom that we implement the new structures. And the new structures that we built 10 years ago are not as strong as the structure we built today. So, to be fair to the means and method and the construction engineering, the, the life safety today is much greater than it is through that evolution of design and building. And it's also just like anything else, it's, it's experiencing these catastrophes because you just don't know until you know, right? So, you had things happen. Shit happens, and you have to adapt and pivot, right? And that's what we do. We, as humans, I don't care what country, what city, or background you're from, that's what we do. We pivot and we accommodate. Mm -hmm. We just finished a project in Cape Town, South Africa, and it's a very nice building on Mooley Point, which is across from the lighthouse there. And most structures there, people, when I was there, people said, oh, we a building a lot of stucco, white stuff. You see the walls there? It's, it's wild in South Africa that there's such a divide, and the wealthier areas have walls, high, high walls, to protect their houses from, from burglars. I'm sure you know about that. Yeah. It's crazy. So they, but they're in Cape Town, the movie point is where they have the, the soccer <laughs> matches and the sports and you know. And we did a, a building there, and instead of making it out of stuff from white, we want to make it out of glass. And aluminum 
and black mm -hmm. for three reasons. Number one is to um, we can maintain it better with the salt water. We can hose it up. We can wash it for maintenance and durability. And also, it's a much more sustainable and resilient material because the beach is sand. So to take sand, which is glass, and put it together it makes a natural sort of a relationship. Um, and that is something that we take inspiration from and we take ideas from. Um, so that was the kind of direction. Very cool. Awesome. And how do you still, how do you still have a full head of area, Rich? I uh, slowly, slowly, you know, we lose it. Um, at the end of the day, you know, nobody gets out of here alive. Everybody has uh, it's a, it was a, it was a pun or just, huh? That was a pun. Right? That's a pun. Yeah, we have. Look, it's an interesting. I'm 60 in November, and what happens is that you have to take life one day, and in the trials and tribulations that we go through life, I'll give you an example. In 2000, and I think this is the most important question I asked the entire the entire time. Yes, <laughs> in 2004, 2005. We sat down and uh, we were very busy then. It came to me a couple of engineers from Georgia Tech, and they were from Lebanon, and they said, listen, Kobe, we want you to come and work in Abu Dhabi. And I said, why Abu Dhabi? And I said, because the market eventually will slow down in Florida, and you should have another branch. I said, what's wrong with Dubai? And they said, well, we don't want you to go to Dubai. We want you to come to Abu Dhabi because we want architects to come to Abu It's a stable community. I remember you talking about this on Bradley's podcast, actually. Did I? You mentioned this. No, go on. And, on. And, and we want you to be here to become part of our community. Um, so that's what I did. And as the market cooled off here, and we had the, the crash in 07, 08, 09, um, we were working diligently in the Middle East. And what's good about working in certain regions like Abu Dhabi, it's in the same time zone as Moscow. It's the same time. It's very close in time zone to Europe. It's very close in time zone to Tel Aviv. Um, so I was able to travel and do work within those hours. And so our office in Abu Dhabi, we had three offices. That we you still do it? Not anymore. Because what happened is back then the oil was up. I mean, the construction was strong in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Since then, construction is still going on, but not to the rate of exposure. So now it's slowed down? It has slowed down. Interesting. Okay. And have you done work in Israel or not? I have done work in Israel for Bar Ilan University, for the Hajjaj Brothers. Um, Sounds familiar, but I'm not sure. In the, in the, uh, They're developers? Yes, in Israel. Um, very nice. And uh, I've done some work in Israel. And I like working in Israel. But again, in Israel, there are many, many architects. So they don't really necessarily need somebody there. Unless they want to make a signature building or unique. We made a beautiful um, design, very sculptural for the Nuva site there. Um, and eventually, we'll go ahead and get there. That's awesome. And, and definitely want to go into, I mentioned also on Brad's podcast that you knew I know you're an architect. Don't focus on the crappy attempt at the wallpaper. Mm -hmm. The AC messed it up to all these things. And then these pictures are just random pictures. So I know you're I know you don't love the whole uh, I like it. Yeah, forgive me, forgive me. It's enjoyable. Very much. It's just a you know the flip until until God willing I have a, a full blown studio which will happen. You know, you gotta start a little by little. So that's the talk. Um, in terms of you mentioned you know Putin. Right. Huh? You mentioned you knew that you knew Vladimir Putin. Right? Well, what happened is I worked in Sochi, Russia, and um, the project that we did is in we did work in Kaluga, which is outside Tambov, uh, Moscow. Um, but one of the projects that we did is in Sochi before it became the Olympic destination mm -hmm. in world renowned. Um, the Soviets always took the best location in the city. Um, in this case, in Sochi, and they put a, a, a Moscow hotel, which we call the Moscow hotel. And there is where we developed a master plan and a design on this huge project. And the Russians have a, a form 
they call it F-O-R-U-N. And in that form, it's basically a convention. And they present the project for all the company, and I presented the project back then to uh, Vladimir Putin, who came in. Uh, and I presented the project to him and to his entourage. And that was it. That was back at the turn of the century. It's extremely cool. It's so interesting. I, uh, have you have you taken the time to maybe get on horseback with, with Vlad and you know, take your shirt off and you see his picture? I do, I do. <laughs> but no, I don't. You know, You've seen that picture, right? Yes, I have. <laughs> he's intense. He's an he's a unique individual. He is, he is. We're not going to get political, but uh, it's very, that's very, very cool. Though. Yes. Uh, we can wrap it up here. Thank you. So just for the sake for the sake of the edit, I'll explain later why I'm asking you. But you're definitely not a cop, correct? No. Okay. Fantastic. An hour of you getting drunk and pretending to be in The Departed. You know what? I'm sorry. <laughs> Lily. Okay, but I just need to know, are you a cop? I'm not a cop. Are you a I'm not a cop. <laughs> Kobe, thank you so much for coming. It's uh, really is surreal to have you in my apartment doing an episode. I know it's, you're, you're a busy guy and you took valuable time, so I very much appreciate it. Guys, I hope you really got a lot of value from the episode. Make sure to check out his, his work. Uh, your website is kobeparp.com, I imagine? Yes, it okay. is. And you can check him out on Instagram at Kobe Carp. Uh, if you need anything built, if you need any any architectural design, he's the man to go to. Anybody that's anybody uh, knows him. And uh, make sure to subscribe, like, and share. Until next time.